starting a new series of sermons entitled Question Mark. We're going to look at the different questions that come up that we find in the Gospel of Mark throughout the season of Lent. So I invite you to hear these holy words from the second chapter. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of God for the people of God. We again say a word of welcome to all of you this morning. We're grateful for your presence as we gather in this holy place. We want you to know we're shorthanded one clergy person for the next couple of months because Jennifer Verish Schreckengost gave birth this week to Winston Theodore. And so we celebrate the addition to our church family. Bless her heart, in the last few days, Jennifer was ready to give birth to Winston Theodore. So obviously she's at home resting, recovering, and taking on the responsibility of being a mom now to three little boys. And so we're grateful for that addition to her family and certain that addition to our family as well. Today we're going to look at why Jesus would eat with sinners. Let's bow our head. O oh Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. We all have experienced criticism. People who complain about us have a difference of opinion from our own. There's an old saying that if you want to avoid criticism, you just say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. Criticism is a part of the life in which we live. There are always going to be people who find fault in us, who don't like some kind of decision we've made, some kind of choice that is ours. Criticism is a part of life. Jesus knew that all too well. He faced a barrage of criticism on a continual basis, oftentimes because of what he said, but even more often because of what he did of who he included, of who was welcome into his family we call the kingdom of God. One day, Jesus is walking along. He comes to a tax collector's booth. Well, we all know about tax collectors in Jesus' day and time. They're turncoats, they're traitors, they work for the Roman oppressive government. They are known as manipulators and deceivers, greedy people who take advantage of others. And Jesus comes into the one who is known as Levi. And to his presence, he makes himself known. And Jesus says to this tax collector, this despised one, follow me. And immediately, Levi leaves his tax collector's booth and follows Jesus. Not literally just lagging behind him, but it literally means he becomes a disciple of Jesus in the moment. This despised and hated man is invited by Jesus himself to follow him. 
Now, what makes this story even more extraordinary, unimaginable for lots of people, is what Jesus does next that brings on criticism. Those who complain, who don't understand why Jesus would have the audacity to do what he has done. For Jesus follows Levi to his house, and there, there are other tax collectors and sinners, the generic term for all of us. And Jesus has a meal with them. The Pharisees who are looking on are incredulous, can't believe what is happening. And they ask, why would you eat with tax collectors and sinners of all people? And Jesus said, I have come for those who are sick. They're the ones in need of a doctor. I have not come for the righteous. And what Jesus means by that is the self-righteous, those who believe that they're superior, those who believe they are without sin. Now, most of us are at least honest enough to say publicly, we know we're not without sin. Though my brother Tom, who is also a United Methodist pastor, one Sunday in a sermon said, we are all sinners. At the end of the service of worship, a member of his congregation came up to him and she said, listen, you need to know I'm offended by your sermon. I do not sin. He said, I beg your pardon? She said, so the next time you make a generalization that we are all sinners, please offer up my name and separate me from everybody else. <laughs> now Tom said to her, you realize that 1 John says, those of you who say you are without sin are liars and the truth is not in you. We acknowledge that we are a people of sin, but oftentimes we acknowledge that somehow ours is just a little bit less than everyone else's. Not quite as bad. Or there's an excuse, there's a reason, there's a justification for why, I, why it is we did what we did, said what we said, or left undone that which we should have done. But the truth is we're all sinners. We all have failures and shortcomings and we make mistakes and we just blatantly choose wrong over right, that which is contrary to God's will because we are selfish sometimes and we want our way no matter what. It is called sin. And every one of us fit into that category. And Jesus has a meal with sinners and tax collectors. So why would Jesus eat with sinners? Because if Jesus chose to eat with non-sinners, he would eat every meal alone. In the life of the church, we believe that we are the body of Christ, the literal presence of Christ in the world, which means we have to live a certain way and act a certain way. And what we believe is this, that Jesus Christ is God in flesh. And the Bible tells us that God is love. That means any time the one who is love invites us into his presence, all are welcome because love rejects no one. So it's our responsibility in the church of Jesus Christ to open up the doors and welcome those who come into our midst. We don't categorize, we don't compartmentalize, we don't give a litmus test. We just welcome those who choose to be among us, who long to be in relationship with the one who invites them into his presence. Interestingly enough, Levi immediately gets up and follows Jesus, and then immediately Jesus follows Levi all the way to Levi's house and has the audacity, the gall, to have a meal with all of those tax collectors and sinners. You see, in Jesus' day and time, in the culture in which he lived, Jewish people believed that to have a meal with another person was a sign of solidarity and acceptance. 
The Pharisees knew that, and they witnessed Jesus of all people saying through a meal that I am in solidarity with you. I accept you for who you are. You are broken, you are sinful, you have made mistakes, and you're still welcome in my presence. And who doesn't need that? There are people who say, the thing that bothers me about the church is people in the church think they're better than everybody else. On the contrary, we are simply people who acknowledge that we fall short and that we are in need of a Savior. This Savior who invites everybody, who says, you're all welcome. Do you remember Mary Magdalene? She is the one who says, before any other human being in history, I have seen the Lord, he is risen. That same Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed, filled with the devil at one time, and Jesus frees her from that. And she's welcome to be in his presence. So welcome, in fact, she proclaims the greatest news in human history. You remember the woman at the well? Jesus strikes up a conversation with her. She's been married five times. Now she's living with a man. She's not even married to him. And Jesus offers her living water. She's invited. She's welcome to be a part of his kingdom. And she goes off and becomes the first evangelist, the first person ever to tell anybody outside the Jewish community about this man named Jesus. Do you remember the woman who's caught in the act of adultery? Interestingly enough, this very woman... The man is gone from the picture. Evidently, as a man, he was free to go his own way. They use her as a pawn to try to discredit Jesus. And Jesus simply says to all who are gathered around, if none of you have ever sinned, you're welcome to throw a stone at her. In Jewish culture, all Jews knew that only God was without sin. So if they were to throw a stone, they are publicly saying that they are God, which means they themselves would be stoned. So they know they're a person of sin. They drop their stone and walk away. And Jesus says to the woman, go and sin no more. Grace and mercy and forgiveness extended to her, an adulteress. Not to mention what Peter and Paul did, and not to mention what you have done and I have done. And every one of us are still welcome into the body of Christ because the one we emulate, the one we follow, the one who is our king of all kings, himself invited sinners and tax collectors, the most repugnant of people, to be welcomed. The rule of St. Benedict is clear in monasteries. There is to be a porter at the door 24-7. When one knocks at the door, the porter is to say, thank God for your presence, not even knowing who's on the other side of the door. And when the door is opened... The porter once again says, thank God for your presence, and then immediately informs all the other monks that one is present in their midst for whom they give thanks. The author Dorothy Parker, on the other hand, used to answer her phone by saying, what fresh hell is this? So what do we do in the church? Do we say in our own way to people who come in here who long to be in the presence of the rest of us and most importantly in the presence of God who are just looking and just searching and just in desperate need, who are broken and sinful and who have made mistakes and just want to know they can still be loved by God? Do we say to those people, thank God you're in our presence or in some way do we say to them, what fresh hell is this? People say, you know, the church is full of hypocrites. Of course it is. We don't make light of that. We're all hypocrites. A hypocrite is one who, by definition, preaches one thing and does that which is contrary to what she or he preaches. And the church is called a three-letter word, sin. I love the story in Matthew 21. Jesus is in conversation with the women of the night. And while he's in conversation with them, the elders and the chief priests stand at a distance and say to themselves, mm, 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 look at who Jesus is talking to now. Jesus, keenly aware of that, turns to them and says, I need to tell you, these women, 
and tax collectors, well, they'll get to the kingdom of God before you do. Now, let me just tell you, if you tell a self-righteous, sanctimonious person that somebody they consider to be inferior actually has a better relationship with God than they do, it doesn't go over well with them. So they killed him. But he's right. Why does Jesus eat with sinners? Because he would eat alone if it weren't for sinners. I have a good friend who was in one of my churches, and he runs political campaigns. He's run political campaigns for some of the most familiar, famous politicians in our country. He's made a lot of money doing it. One of the things that he tries to do is exploit the weaknesses of his respective candidate's opponent. If he can find some kind of moral failing or some kind of personal indiscretion or some kind of political faux pas that he can exploit, then he is excited to do so. See, we're the very antithesis of that in the church. We don't exploit failings. We don't have time. We're all failures in that regard. We're all sinful. We all make mistakes. We exploit the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of our Lord. That's what we exploit. We don't categorize. We don't compartmentalize. We don't put people into certain places where they have to stay. And we don't decide who's worthy and who's unworthy. If you look at the most unworthy of people in Scripture, the ones who are sick that society has cast off to the side, the ones who are considered less, the ones who in some way or another are inferior, Jesus always welcomes them. And we don't always do that well in the church. In fact, right now, our denomination does it very poorly. The United Methodist Church, as we know it, has made some rather poor decisions over the last couple of weeks. I've been a United Methodist pastor for 33 years, and I am sorely disappointed. We have a statement in our discipline that has been there a long time, and they refuse to take it out that says a certain category of people are incompatible with Christian teaching. You all, everybody is incompatible with Christian teaching, every human being. Sin is incompatible. Some of you right now are working on your income tax, and there's going to be a part of you that says, who cares? The government has trillions of dollars. I think I'll cheat a little bit. That's incompatible with Christian teaching. There are those in the church, the Bible tells us that if you're divorced and you marry somebody else, you commit adultery. We have divorced people in the church. I think if you understand Jesus' point behind that, he's standing up for the rights of women, but nevertheless, it says that. Do you know in the Old Testament it says if you eat oysters, you're in big trouble? That's an affront to God. There are people in this church who have eaten oysters before. I know it. I know it. I just know it. Do you know what? Now, this is between us, but there are people in this church who have tattoos. And the Old Testament says, do not mark your body. We have all kinds of people in the church, and if you decide, well, that's all Old Testament stuff, let me flip over to the New Testament, and it says women are to keep silent in the church. Do you hear that? We had the audacity a moment ago to have a women's choir rejoice, sing a beautiful piece of music to us. Praises to God, but the Bible says women are to keep silent in church. The Bible says in the New Testament, in the First Timothy, the second chapter, Women are not to wear gold or pearls or any costly attire. Mm -mm -mm, some of you are in huge trouble. <laughs> says women are to cover their heads when they pray, and men are not to grow their hair long, because if they do, it's an affront to God. Some of you men, you have nothing to worry about, trust me, but nevertheless, it's in there. Some of, you are, some of us are a little overweight. The Bible talks about gluttony. Many of us are adulterers in this church. I mean, just flat, 
adulterers. Because Jesus said, if you've ever looked at lust with lust at another human being, you've committed adultery. My point is simply to say this. There are all kinds of things in the Bible that say all kinds of things. But if you look at what Jesus says and what Jesus does, he never puts people in an inferior status. And who is going to be the one that makes a determination about who's worthy and who's not? I mean, if that's going to be how we play church, who gets to decide? Is it the clergy? I know these clergy, I'm telling you. They are far from perfect. I am telling you, they make mistakes. We get it wrong. We commit sin. So it can't be your clergy. I look out in the congregation at a bunch of wonderful, wonderful people, but there's no one out here who's without sin. Who determines whose sin's worthy and whose sin is unworthy enough to be here? Only Jesus Christ makes that call because he's the only one who's ever walked the face of the earth without sin, and he's the one that says everyone is welcome. Even you nasty tax collectors and all you other sinners out there, you have a place in my kingdom. Why would Jesus eat with sinners? Because he would eat all alone if it weren't for the sinners. And he wants to eat with us. What would the church be like without sinners? Hollow and silent and empty. That's what the church would be like without sinners. All are welcome. God takes care of all that stuff. But our job is to say all are welcome. God determines what we do. We don't live a life where we get to do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want. We know that. But God is the one who makes that choice. God is the one who decides. Our job is to say you're welcome. And as long as I'm the senior pastor of Memorial Drive United Methodist Church, all are welcome here. Because I'm unworthy to be your pastor and you still allow that to happen. They're unworthy to be your pastor, you still allow that to happen. The choir is unworthy to stand up here and sing praises to God and you still allow that to happen. You're unworthy to even be here and God still allows that to happen because we live by the grace, forgiveness, and mercy of our God who knows our deepest, darkest secrets and still says to us, I want to eat with you. Thanks be to God for that. So why does Jesus eat with sinners? Because he desperately wants to eat with you and he desperately wants to eat with me. And that's good enough. Hallelujah. Amen.